Fossil record is the storehouse of life's history. Piled high with the shells and skeletons of past lives. For paleontologists such as myself, here are all the clues for hundreds of millions of years of animal evolution. But as I move back in geological time, so I come across a fundamental problem. Most of the evolution of life has left no record at all. And that's more than 80% of Earth history. Three billion years during which we know little about the single-celled creatures which evolved in that immense interval of time. But fundamental new evidence suggests that we will have to radically alter our understanding of the early evolution of animals. About 550 million years ago, at the beginning of the Cambrian, there was an explosion of animal life. The first skeletons appeared. But these skeletons are very different indeed from those which we're familiar with at the moment. They're called the small skeletal fossils. And they are very small. There may be thousands in just one kilogram of rock. In our laboratory alone, we process and sift through hundreds of kilograms of rock, picking out the fossils from amongst the debris. Their detailed shapes only emerge under enormous magnification. Some are clearly the shells of mollusks, tiny snail-like creatures. And we find fragments too, teeth and scales. These suggest that animals were evolving defensive armor against predators, which we assume were the ones with the teeth. But none of these bits show us the whole animal. Using these fragments to reconstruct the entire animal is just the same as if I tossed a jigsaw out of an aeroplane at 30,000 feet. The answer to this puzzle is revealed by rocks in places like the Burgess Shale Quarry, high in the mountains of British Columbia. Five hundred and thirty million years ago, this was a muddy seabed where exceptional conditions preserved thousands of soft-bodied animals that tell us more than shells or skeletons ever can. Some would be at home in a science fiction movie. Opabinia is armed with a clasper to hold struggling prey and pass it back to its mouth, with its five eyes keeping a lookout for more victims. The bizarre hallucinogenia seems to have mastered walking on seven pairs of stilts. But what of its seven tentacles? Not long enough to pass food around the head to where its mouth ought to be. So perhaps it had seven mouths. As our studies began to uncover the fundamental strangeness of these Burgess Shale animals, we had the first hints of the shape of things to come. One of the most exciting things about working on these Burgess shell fossils is that we found representatives of almost all the modern groups of animals, from worms through various kinds of sponges, even to chordates, the earliest representatives of the vertebrates, which of course include ourselves. But in addition to those familiar types of organism, we've also found some 20 unique sorts of animal that don't fit readily into modern groups. And this suggests that there was a, a rather greater disparity of form in the Cambrian than there is today. What's emerged from this is the need for a radically new picture of early evolutionary history. Because the variety of designs we now see in the Burgess fossils had been overlooked ever since their first discovery. And they were discovered in 1909 by America's greatest paleontologist, C.D. Walcott, head of the Smithsonian Institution. 
But Walcott was convinced that the history of life necessarily was progressive, began with a few simple, primitive precursors to creatures who came later, and moved ever upward and outward. So his view of life looks something like this, from a few simple beginnings up and out. So he took every one of these Burgess organisms and shoehorned them into modern groups. Some became relatives of insects, others became worms. Now, 20 years ago, Burgess quarries were reopened. The task of re-describing the fossils was assigned to Harry Whittington of Cambridge University. He and Derek Briggs and Simon Conway Morris, his two brilliant students, found a new world. Because what they have done has led to a remarkably radical revision of what everything looks like. It looks, instead of the old view, that you begin with a few simple primitive precursors that exactly the opposite happened that in fact, very rapidly at the Cambrian explosion, we achieved on Earth more disparity, that is a wider range of anatomical designs, not more species, of course, because this is just one quarry, but within very few species, an enormous range. So how could such a variety of designs have arisen so quickly? What sparked the Cambrian explosion must have been a change in the environment, both in the physical conditions, but also the interactions of the organisms themselves. At the end of the pre-Cambrian, there is clear evidence that a supercontinent broke up, and a corresponding rise in sea level flooded the edges of the land. As more and more space opened up, the living area for new marine animals expanded. There are suggestions, too, of an increase in nutrients in the oceans and of a rise in atmospheric oxygen levels. Plate motions and volcanic activity may also have shifted the chemical balances in the sea. Any of these global changes might have triggered the rapid rise of animals, which we now know was global too, as Burgess-type animals have been discovered at more than 30 new sites from China to Siberia. So there is no doubting at all about the magnitude of this biological event. It's the first filling of an empty ecological barrel. For animals, there were almost limitless opportunities. And not only that, but there seems to be little competition for either food or space. Almost anything was permissible. I just don't believe that barrel filling is an adequate explanation for a very simple reason, namely the magnitude of the effect. There have been no new basic designs of animal life originating since the Cambrian. And therefore, I think there must be something internal to the structure of organisms that actively prevents the origination of this kind of fundamental diversity again. I confess we don't know much about what it could be. The answer may come in development in embryology. It may be that once you set out a ground plan of animal development, that it's so intricate that it simply can't be disrupted in many ways. And so genetic systems may themselves become less forgiving of major structural reorganization through time. It's an intriguing suggestion that in animals today, from mammals to birds, to reptiles, the genetic potential for more variable body plans may have been lost. Work in developmental biology may eventually provide us with some indication that different genetic mechanisms might have operated back in the Cambrian. But happily, the fossil record also provides us with some clues. Work on Cambrian trilobites suggests that individuals were very much more variable in aspects of shape and dimensions than later trilobites. And if this variability were under genetic control, it may indicate some genetic flexibility in the Cambrian, which disappeared later on. And the lack of that genetic flexibility subsequently may explain why no totally new body plans evolved after the Cambrian. But the explanation may, in fact, be a great deal simpler. It may be that once any new niche opened up or any niche was vacated, there was always a, an existing group of organisms ready to evolve into it. As the Cambrian barrel filled, so competition increased and the world became a very much tougher place. Most Cambrian animals are extinct. Seen in hindsight, the success of the surviving group seems to be absolutely inevitable. But there's not a shred of evidence that those doomed to extinction were in any way inferior at all. Take this Burgess beast, we're waxier. I could argue that it became extinct because it molted its whole skeleton, 
rather than steadily growing a larger one, like the successful mollusks. But if Wewaxia had made it, and the mollusks not, I could just as easily argue the whole case the other way round. Back in the Cambrian, and deprived of hindsight, there seems to be no way to choose between them. And that's a general principle of history. It doesn't apply only to the Burgess Shale. It applies to the entire history of life. Just think of the immense improbability of human evolution. We are not the foreordained product of an evolutionary process inevitably leading to us. We are the end result of hundreds of thousands of contingencies of a sequence of events, any one of which had it occurred differently and any one of which could have occurred differently in a hundred different ways would have caused evolution to veer into another pathway which would have been just as sensible and explainable but would not have included the evolution of conscious intelligence. The best example I can give is mass extinction. Dinosaurs died 65 million years ago in a mass extinction that was probably triggered by extraterrestrial impact. Suppose you run the tape of life again, the comet doesn't hit, dinosaurs survive, why not? They've been doing very well for 100 million years, they've only been 65 million years since. Dinosaurs survive, presumably dinosaurs still rule the earth, they don't get any smarter, they didn't for 100 million years. Mammals who had been tiny creatures living in the nooks and crannies of their world, never any bigger than this, are still tiny creatures living in the nooks and crannies of their world, and we wouldn't be here. So in a very real sense, we have to thank our lucky stars for our existence at all. One thing is for certain, the greatest experiment of all time, that of evolutionary diversification, continues. Ever since the initial diversification of animals in the Cambrian, it is clear that some animals have grasped the opportunity and other ones may have let them slip. Chance has surely played some part in controlling the past, and if this is true, so it must control the future also. The Earth is more than four and a half billion years old. We've only appeared halfway through its history. Chances are we won't be around five and a half billion years from now when the sun runs out of fuel, swells to a giant size, and so brings the Earth's evolutionary experiment to an end.